Hey everyone! By this point, you've created a plan for your video with learning objectives and how you're going to achieve them, and created a visual layout for your video using Explain Everything. Now it's time to record your screencast, and that's what we'll cover in this video. So let's get to it. Okay, so what you're seeing here is a recording of my iPad, and I'm recording it like this with my phone suspended above the iPad, just so you'll be able to see everything that I actually do and explain everything to make a basic screencast. Now, before you start recording, you may want to go through this short checklist here just to make sure you have everything you need. First, make sure you have some water and remember to drink it periodically just to keep your voice sounding good. Next, make sure you have some nice quiet clothes that don't make any noise when you move around and make sure that you're recording in a nice quiet room. Make sure that your tablet is charged because recording a screencast eats quite a lot of battery power. And if you're using an external microphone, like a condenser microphone, make sure it's plugged in to the tablet. And the condenser microphone will also take up quite a lot of battery from your tablet. So that's another reason to make sure that it's fully charged before you start recording. Now, before you start recording, you should do a quick sound check. And all that's involved here is just hitting the record button, saying something, and then playing it back to make sure it sounds okay. So we can just do that right now. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Okay, that sounds okay. It sounds a little bit echoey because I'm using my good microphone to record this video instead of having it hooked up into my iPad. But I think that sounds good enough for now. And last, you want to make sure that you have your visual layouts all ready, like I described in a previous video. Now, just to review really quick, a basic screencast is a screencast where you record your voice and what's on the screen at the same time. And I've seen various approaches to producing a screencast like this that people use, and I'll describe the two most common that I've seen here. And I've used both of these approaches as well. One approach, and probably the easiest, is to simply import a bunch of images into Explain Everything, and then just use the pointer tool to point to those images and describe what's going on in them. So this is pretty similar to what you might do if you teach using a PowerPoint presentation. You're simply just describing what's on the slide using a laser pointer to your students. So if you're used to teaching that way, doing a screencast like this will seem pretty familiar to you. Another common approach is what I call a draw and talk screencast. And this is just what it sounds like. You're just writing or drawing on the page as you're narrating what you're doing. And I see a lot of people do this as well. And this is also a really common way to teach in a face-to-face -face classroom. So if you're accustomed to writing on the blackboard or whiteboard or using a dot cam while teaching your students, chances are that this method will be pretty familiar to you. So next, I'll show you how to make a basic screencast using each of these methods. And of course, you can combine them in the same screencast. For example, you can import a bunch of images and talk about them using the laser pointer, but you can also use other tools and explain everything, especially the pen tool and the highlighter tool, to annotate those images that you've imported. And a lot of people do this as well. So next, I'll show you how to make a basic screencast using images that you've imported and simply describing them using the laser pointer. So this page is my visuals layout for this video where I'm simply going to describe this figure that I pulled from LibreTexts. And this is a nice source of images. It's made by the University of California system. So check that out. It can be a nice source of images that you can use for your videos. And most of the images are licensed under a Creative Commons license. Now for these type of screencasts, I like to use the Zoom tool quite a bit because you can use it to focus the student's attention 
on a certain part of the figure that you want them to pay attention to. So I'll be doing that, and of course, using the laser pointer as well to direct their attention to where I want it to be. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and do this. Okay, on this page, I'm going to show you how double fertilization works. But first, let's review the various parts of the carpal, which is the female part of the flower. So here is one carpal, and as you can see, there are various parts. The top part here is called the stigma, and the stigma has a, sick, a sticky substance on it that the pollen grain can stick to during pollination. Next, we have this neck-looking structure here, and that's the style of the carpal. And down here, within the larger portion of the carpal, we have the ovary. And within the ovary, we have several ovules. And the ovules are the structures that house the female gamete, the egg. So as you can see, I'm just taking a pause here, and I can even just pause the video. I'll just go back here and erase everything that's beyond this point and just pause the video and kind of collect my thoughts and think about what I'm going to say next. So I can see here that in the next part of the figure, it looks like the pollen is germinating. Here's the pollen tube and here are the sperm cells. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. So when I'm ready, I can just once again hit the record button and the recording will pick up right where it left off. So here I go. Now once the pollen grain lands on the stigma, cells within the stigma release various compounds that cause the pollen to germinate and form this pollen tube that grows down into the carpal. Okay, so I don't know if you heard that, but an ambulance just drove by. So I think I'll be able to cut that out later. But just in case, I'm going to go back and actually just delete that part and do it again. So I'm going to see where I started here. Yeah, I'm just going to go back and do that whole thing again, because I'm not sure how much of that ambulance sound made it into the recording. So I'm just going to, once again, delete everything beyond this red line here and just start again. And this is a really nice feature of a screencasting program. You don't have to record the entire thing in one perfect take. If you make a mistake, you can just go back and delete it and try again. Okay, so here we go. And let me just make sure that I am where I want to be. How's the female gamete, the egg? Okay, so next I'm gonna talk about pollen tube formation and sperm cells traveling down to the ovule. Now, once the pollen has landed on the stigma, cells within the stigma will release various compounds and cause the pollen grain to germinate and form a pollen tube. And the pollen grain will then release the two sperm cells that it has within it, and those two sperm cells will travel down the pollen tube to the ovule. Okay, so once again, I'm just pausing the recording here and gathering my thoughts and thinking about what I'm going to say next. And I'm also just going to have a drink of water at this point. So the sperm cells eventually make their way all the way down the pollen tube towards the ovule. And the ovule has the female gametophyte, or the embryo sac, within it. And those two sperm cells, shown in blue in this diagram, make their way into the embryo sac. Once again, I'm just collecting my thoughts here, so I can just pause the recording and go back and delete this part and get ready to say the next part of the video. 
So let me just refresh my memory about what I just said. Make their way into the embryo sac. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about what happens once the two sperm cells enter the embryo sac. Once the two sperm cells enter the embryo sac, one of them enters the egg cell, here's that sperm here, and one of them enters this cell called the central cell, and that's this sperm here, okay? And the central cell is also called the binucleate cell because it ha already has, all right, well, I made a mistake there because I, I mumbled a bit. Um, I, I bumbled the phrase binucleate cell. So I'm just gonna go back and delete that see where my mistake was and just go from there. And the central cell is also called the binucleate cell because it ha already has. And the central cell is. Okay, so I'm just gonna go back and delete this part and do that again. Now, this cell is also called the binucleate cell because it has two haploid nuclei, this one and this one. So once the sperm nucleus of one of the two sperm cells enters the central cell, it fuses, that sperm nucleus fuses with both of the polar nuclei. So what we have here is one, two, three haploid nuclei. And when all three of them fuse, they form a triploid nucleus. And we can even draw that in here if we want to. They fuse to make a triploid or 3N nucleus. Okay, so once again, I'm just gonna pause here and gather my thoughts. I finished describing what happens in the central cell. Now I'll probably move on to the nuclear fusion within the egg cell. I'll select my pointer once again and hit record. The nucleus of the sperm cell that made it into the egg cell also fuses with the nucleus of the egg cell that's already there. So that one haploid nucleus of the egg plus the one haploid nucleus of the sperm fuse, and when they do that, they form a diploid nucleus. So now this cell is called the zygote, and this cell is still called the central cell, but it's now a triploid central cell. Okay, so I think I'm almost done here. I'm just gonna select my pointer once again, and just give some conclusion for what I just showed my students. So to summarize, the pollen grain sticks to the stigma and germinates, and the two sperm cells make their way down to the ovule and enter the embryo sac that's within the ovule. One sperm cell goes into the central cell and fuses with the two nuclei there, forming a triploid central cell, and one sperm cell enters the egg, and the nucleus of that sperm cell fuses with the egg nucleus, forming a diploid nucleus, and that is now a zygote. Okay, so once again, I just paused to collect my thoughts, and now I think I'll say something about what the zygote and the central cell actually do, because that's probably what I would normally talk about next. Now, as this ovule and some of the surrounding tissue develops into a seed, this zygote will undergo lots and lots of mitosis to form an embryo, basically a collection of cells that will eventually become the plant. And the central cell will also divide several times by mitosis, and those cells serve to provide nourishment to the growing embryo. Okay, so that's just 
a basic screencast of double fertilization by just describing a figure that describes that process. Now you'll notice that I also annotated this figure a bit because it didn't quite show everything that I wanted to teach the students about. It didn't really tell me anything about the fusion of the nuclei that occurs both in the egg cell and the central cell, so I had to draw that in because I did want to tell the students about it. So next I'll show you how to make a basic screencast using the draw and talk method. Okay, so here I have a visual layout of a diagram that I drew that basically just describes the anatomy of a flower at a pretty basic level. So I'm going to use this to demonstrate how to do a draw and talk screencast. And this is the kind of thing that really lends itself to this type of screencast because the more students draw, the more they'll remember. So this is great for things like plant anatomy and anatomy and physiology. Provided, of course, that what you're drawing is simple enough for you to actually draw. Now, my final diagram in my recording probably won't look quite as nice as this one, but that's okay. Also, I'm going to put this right up on my laptop so I can view it as I do my recording so I don't have to go back and forth between pages. So here's the page where I'll do my draw and talk screencast, and I'm just going to draw basically a diagram of a flower and label its various parts. Okay, on this page, I'm going to show you the basic parts of a flower. And we're going to start with the parts that are on the inside and then work our way outwards. So the very innermost part of a flower is the female reproductive structure shaped something like that. And this whole structure is known as the carpal. And once again, that is the female part of the flower. Now, the top of the carpal, this bit here, is called the stigma. And the stigma has a sticky substance on it that helps the pollen stick to it during pollination. This neck looking structure here is called the style. And within this bulgy bit down here, we have the ovary. And the ovary houses very important parts of the female flower. These are ovules. And each ovule houses the female gametophyte or embryo sac, which in turn houses the egg, which is the female gamete. So those are the various parts of the carpal, and once again, that's the female part of the flower. Okay, so next we have the parts that are just around the carpal if you're looking downward into a flower, and those are the male parts of the flower. The male part of the flower has two parts, a kind of stalky bit and a round bit at the top. Now the stalky bit is called a filament. And the round bit at the top is called the anther. The filament simply holds the anther up and the anther is where pollen is produced. Okay, so I'm just going to pause the screencast here and just kind of take stock of where I am and think about what I want to write and say next. And I'll take a drink of water as well. And whenever I start and stop like this, I like to just rewind a little bit and just to remind myself what I just said. So the talk kind of has a flow to it. And the anther is where pollen is produced. 
Okay, so let's keep going. Now the filament and the anther together make up the male reproductive structure, which is collectively known as the stamen. And you know that it's the male reproductive structure because it has the word men in it. Okay, so I'm just going to pause once again and think about what I'm going to say next. And there's no rush, you can pause as many times as you want. Now most flowers have several stamen surrounding one or more carpels. Okay, now outside of the stamen we have the petals. And you all know what petals are, they're the pretty part of the flower. And they come in various numbers depending on what kind of plant or flower you're talking about. And the function of the petals is usually to attract pollinators, namely insects, especially bees, so that they can transfer the pollen in the anther to the stigma. Okay, so I'm going to pause here and think about what I'm going to say next. And the only thing left, I think, is the sepals. So that's what I'll describe now. Okay, so next, on the outermost part of the flower, we have the sepals. And the sepals serve to protect the inner parts of the flower before the flower blooms, when it's still a bud. Okay, so that's all the material I think I want to cover on this page. So now I'll just kind of summarize what I've covered so far. So to summarize, going from the inside out, we have the carpal which has the stigma, the style, and the ovary, which houses the ovules. Outside of that, we have the stamens, which has the anther and the filament, and the anther is where pollen develop. Then outside of that, we have the petals, which attract pollinators. And outside of that, we have the sepals, which protect the flower before it blooms. So that's an example of a so-called draw and talk screencast. Now, I hope you're a slightly better artist than I am, but I found that it really doesn't matter that much because when I look in the notebooks of my students, most of their diagrams look much, much better than mine anyway. Before I finish up, just a few more tips on screencasting. Remember to speak slowly, but naturally, and kind of conversationally. In other words, use your teaching voice, which you already know how to do because you're a teacher. Just remember it when you're making your videos as well. Next, remember that you can pause your recording and take some time and collect your thoughts and think about what you're going to say and draw next. Also, try to keep your videos short. And as most of you probably already know, Younger students have shorter attention spans, so try to keep that in mind when you're deciding how much content to put in a given video. That being said, some things require more time to explain than others, so if you need 15 minutes to explain a topic, then take 15 minutes. Last, and perhaps most importantly, do one or two practice runs without even hitting the recording button. Just Pretend that you're actually doing the screencast and go through the entire thing. Don't worry if you make mistakes along the way. Just do the whole thing all the way through. And this will get you more comfortable with the content when it comes time to actually record your screencast. In other words, it'll make you a bit less nervous when you record. Okay. 
So at this point, try and record your own screencast using your visuals layout as a guide. And remember, if you make a mistake, there's no need to start all over again. You can just back up a little bit in the recording and delete your mistake and then keep recording as if nothing ever happened. That's the beauty of a screencasting program. It takes all the pressure out of recording and there's no need to get that perfect take. Now, in the next video, I'll show you how to make a talking head video, which is basically what I'm doing right now. See you then.